know, you can wait a long time sometimes for it to hit you, for you to get it. Especially if you are looking for something and you've been told it's one thing, but you're kind of looking for another. Have you ever been staring through the cabinet looking for that thing that you're pretty sure is in the red bag, but it's actually in a blue box? And it's right there in the front. It's right there, you know. But you don't see it because you don't expect it. You know that time when uh, someone that you know well from work turns up at a store that you're in and you know you know them, but you can't think of who they are because they're not what you expect them to be. They're not where you expect them to be. If you've been told something is one thing and it turns out to be another, pretty hard to get that. Now, I'm saying that because many of the people of Jesus' time were waiting for someone called the Messiah, the, God, the one chosen by God, the one who would set them free. Now during Jesus' lifetime, this ancient nation that we know today as Israel, that goes back thousands of years, had not been a free, independent nation for centuries. They had been under the thumbs of the mighty Roman Empire, and before that, they had been under the thumb of the Greeks, and before that, the Persians, and before that, the Babylonians, and for that, the Assyrians, it was a long, long time that they were not free to be who they were. But they also had books and writings. Well, they had scrolls. They didn't have books yet. But they had scrolls that told them the stories of times when the nation of Israel had been free. And they read these often. And in these books, we call them today the Bible, in these books there were stories uh, of uh, ancient heroes and images of a future hero, someone who would come in the future, the rise of a great, great leader, the Messiah, someone they said would come one day who had the power of the great King David and the faith of Elijah, the desert prophet, and, and the vision of the great preacher and theologian Isaiah, a superhero who would make them into a national power, a worldwide power once again. And that person would be known as the chosen one, the anointed one, the one chosen by God. In the language of the ancient Hebrews, the word was the Messiah, the Messiah. In the language of the Greeks, later on, it was Christ or Christ, the one God chose or sent to set the people free. And most of the time, what the people were picturing was that this chosen one, this leader would come and he would have a sword. And he would raise an army. And he would fight against the people that oppressed them. And that's who they were waiting for. That Messiah who would come and have the power to set them all free again. And they were waiting for that. For a long time. And you know, if you end up waiting long enough, you might forget what you're waiting on and just go about your business. If you've been told you've got a visitor coming, you know, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe the next day, you're very excited about it, you're looking forward to having this visitor come, but do you spend every minute of those three days staring out the window waiting for them to come with your hand on the door to run out and greet them? You might do that for a little while. You might do it through the morning of the first day. And then you start thinking, uh, maybe they're not going to come. Or then you start wondering when they're going to be there. And then you remember all the other things you have to do. And eventually you pick up your net and you go fishing. And that's what happened back then. Morning passes. Lunch comes and goes. Next day comes. The next day. Such is Simon's life. Simon has been waiting all of his life to welcome and serve the Messiah. He believes the Messiah is coming. And he's been waiting to do his part for them, as have his parents and his grandparents and his great-great-grandparents. These people have been waiting for a long, long time. And do you think they're all still standing with their faces up against the glass? They're not because, first of all, there isn't any glass because it's 2,000 years ago. And second of all, because waiting, you eventually forget what you're waiting for. So mostly, Simon was out fishing. That was his business. And he was out there fixing his boat. 
and talking with his wife and meeting friends at the pub and going to worship and reading what he could and fixing his boat and going out fishing and coming home and talking with friends and fixing his boat and throwing his nets out and fixing his boat because everybody knows if you've ever had a boat that's mostly what you do you spend your time fixing your boat and that's what he was doing bought a house settled in made himself a life and then this guy named Jesus comes down from Nazareth and Simon meets him and Jesus isn't like anyone he has ever known his words have great power he's not carrying a sword he's not carrying anything he just comes with these ideas with these thoughts and prayers and one day he tells Simon you come with me you travel with me you follow me I'm gonna teach you to catch people instead of fish and Simon drops everything and he goes with Jesus and he travels with him for three years and it changes his life it changes him here's what happens Simon sits and listens to Jesus and he asks Jesus questions and he gets surprising answers and Jesus does not talk about victory he doesn't talk about war. He doesn't talk. He instead talks about forgiveness and love. He doesn't talk about how much we hate the Romans or those awful Samaritans that live over there. He doesn't talk about that. He talks about forgiveness and kindness. He doesn't preach a path to make you wealthy or powerful. Instead, he talks about a path of service and compassion. And Simon sees Jesus do amazing things. He sees him walking on water. He sees Jesus reach out and touch and heal people that have hideous diseases. And he sees Jesus touch and heal a Roman soldier. And he sees Jesus heal a lame person by first of all forgiving him of his sins. And then healing his body as well. He watches as Jesus welcomes a woman as if she were equal to men. Many women in fact. He watches as Mary Magdalene who is just crazy and probably kind of evil as well how she comes to Jesus and is freed from whatever it was that was driving her nuts and becomes a good and powerful and wise person he watches as Jesus goes into this guy's house his name is Matthew he's a tax collector he's a traitor he's one of the worst of all the sinners and Jesus calls him and says hey Matthew you come with me too he watches as Jesus talks about future events and they don't include freedom for Israel he includes terrible trouble ahead Jesus doesn't make even one step towards collecting an army and then he sees these things that are impossible to believe he sees Jesus feed a crowd of 5,000 people with just a few bits of food he doesn't, he doesn't understand how that can happen and, and was he really, was he really walking on water is that what was happening was that a dream did that really happen it seems to have really happened out on a boat on Lake Galilee now all of this stuff Peter sees but here's what he doesn't see because what he doesn't see is just as important he doesn't see any armies he doesn't see any swords he doesn't hear any denunciation of foreigners or Romans or Greeks or immigrants or refugees or anyone he doesn't see anyone get pushed aside who is in need he doesn't see poor people being blamed for being poor he doesn't see that and he doesn't see anybody getting rich either for that matter none of these things happen while he's with Jesus and there are no arms there are no forts there are no walls there's not even a permanent headquarters no place even to just sit and rest for a while there's no wealth there's no treasury there's no embezzling well maybe a little bit we'll get to that later another when we get to Lent there's no income but there is charity and Simon Peter sees all of this Simon looks at this and he can't just can't understand it and then one day after all of this happens Jesus sits down with his disciples and he says to them this he says who do you think I am he voices the question that they've all had in their minds and they all know that Jesus is the most remarkable person they've ever met and they say what they have been thinking that Jesus is some kind of reincarnation of one of the great heroes of the past that's what they're thinking and then the lights go on Bing! 
All of a sudden, Simon Peter understands what's going on. When Jesus says this, who do you say I am? Simon Peter says, why? You're the Christ. You're, you're the Christ. You're the, the Messiah. You are the anointed one. Why, you're, you're the God's chosen one. You are the guy that we've been waiting for for centuries. He finally gets it. He finally sees. And we probably can't quite catch the sense of what's happening to Simon Peter at this time because we uh, are so used to the idea of Jesus that we even have made Jesus' title into a name. Jesus Christ, we say, when we probably should say Jesus the Christ. And for Simon, it was a life-changing moment. And Jesus responds to that moment by changing Simon's name to Peter, which means the rock, Rocky. The one who will be the foundation for the community of Jesus' people. And that's what Simon gets. This is the one that we've been waiting for. And, and you, sitting here today thinking about this, you might say, you might say, when I say to you that Simon Peter recognized that Jesus was the Christ, you might say, so what? You might say, so what? And you might have a point. Even if Jesus of Nazareth is the one that the prophets talked about, it's still 2,000 years ago, right? I mean, it's been a long time. The only way it would matter is if the power of Jesus was still somehow active in the world. It was still affecting people. If it was still changing things. If it was transforming everything. Is it? If you ask me, I would say, yeah. The power of Christ is still active and is still changing things. I know for certain that the grace and truth of the Chosen One, the Messiah, has touched me profoundly and changed the person that I am and is continuing to change that. And you know, here's what else is going on in the world. I can't see that too well, but we've got all kinds of things going on. In Charlottesville, Virginia, we've got haters and hater-haters fighting with each other. We've seen this at the white supremacist rally, and it's been a lot of conflict in our country. In Syria and Afghanistan, thousands of people still dying. North Korea launches missiles, and Russia invades and interferes in other places in the world. And we show our muscles and, our place, and place sanctions on countries, and it mostly just hurts the poor people who are in there because the wealthy people have already gathered all the power around for themselves, and they have what they need. And we have drones that can fly anywhere in the world world and attack people from unseen heights and all around the world today are people who want to have power over other people and all around this room today are people who want to have power over somebody at least there's got to be somebody I can order around out there that's what little brothers are for most of us are looking for a messiah with a sword and not just politics, in our daily lives too, in our relationships where we play power games with others, our businesses where we're looking to have control over the market and then trying to raise the profit level as much as possible. So I ask you this question, if Jesus came and sat down with us and said, who do you think I am, would we recognize that he is the one that we've been waiting for? Because he doesn't bring us power like that. Even if we claim Jesus is Lord of this world, it's often Jesus with the sword that we want. And I wonder if Jesus said to us today, who do you think I am? Whether we would recognize him with his empty, nail-scarred hands. Can we take as our Savior and guide one who left the sword and picked up the cross? Can we see that? Well, if we can, it means that we have come to see that God has come to us in Jesus Christ and is among us in the spirit of Jesus Christ, teaching us what it means to love one another. And then, then, then we're solid rocks. Then we're Peters. Then we're rocks that we can build on. And the gates of hell can't stand against it.
Isn't that what you said, Darby, when you read the scriptures? Must be true. All hail the power of Jesus' name, the name that doesn't seek power. Amen. You've been listening to a sermon by Rev. Stephen Carnahan, pastor of High Street Congregational Church in Auburn, Maine. If you feel inspired by what you hear, we invite you to join us in person for worship services every Sunday morning, beginning at 10 o'clock. Of course, you can always listen to Steve's sermons on the web. New sermons are posted every Monday by midday. Please take a moment to explore this website for more information about our church or visit our Facebook page at High Street Congregational Church, comma, UCC. We hope that God's presence will be known to you every hour of every day and that God's blessings will rest upon you now and always. See you next week.